there's a direct transition from the last talk to my talk, which is the air conditioner comment, because uh, one of the points I'm going to make is that air conditioners are the new transformers in this talk that we're going to want to talk about. And if we use those to mitigate the consequences of a temperature on, uh, on, violence, on, on violence, we create other problems. Uh, as usual, all solutions have unintended consequences. Um, in preparing this talk, this is the first time that my 15-year-old got interested in something that I was doing, and uh, it's pretty obvious what his contributions to the talk are. Um, fossil fuel use, burning fossil fuels, is the major uh, contribution by man uh, to climate change. And understanding future energy use is critical because future energy use tells us what emissions are likely to be and what those likely damages that, that, are, that come from them. It also is one of the basis of country negotiations over climate change because they form a baseline as to what your country is likely to contribute to, uh, to, uh, uh, to pollution and um, therefore uh, what your response uh, needs to be. So for example, if China wasn't going to use much energy uh, and they weren't going to emit very much, it wouldn't be a big controversy. But because China is central in terms of what we forecast their energy use, negotiations with them become critical. And so uh, this, uh, uh, the forecasts uh, have become very controversial. A second reason uh, that we're really interested in is investing in energy infrastructure takes a long lead time. And if we underpredict energy use, we can end up with underinvestment. Those under, that underinvestment is going to lead to energy shortages. Those of you who were in California a number of summers ago that experienced blackouts understand the need for investing in uh, generating infrastructure on time. Uh, when there are shortages, that leads to global price spikes and has consequences for economic development. And so we're very interested in these uh, forecasts. Okay. Um, to get an idea of energy use globally, uh, this is a picture that my colleague, uh, Catherine Wolfram, uh, who a lot of this today's talk is, is based on, came up with this. This is a, a satellite view of the world at night, and it tells you, ba just based on the lights, where uh, the energy use is going on. And you can see most of the energy use is going on in North America and uh, Western Europe. If you were to overlay on that or look at that, that's not where the population is. The population is in India, in China, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in, uh, in Mexico. And so when you overlay lights on top of where the population is, you can see there are large numbers of people who aren't yet consumers of the types of appliances of cars and stoves and refrigerators, microwaves and irons. And that just is a potential that as we see economic development, as poverty falls in these parts of the world, those people are gonna become first time refrigerator owners and a first-time refrigerator, if we have a billion people coming online with new refrigerators, that's a big bang in the demand for energy. In fact, if you look at um, projections of energy growth uh, and emissions uh, throughout uh, the world, uh, we find that the developing world is where all the action is. Um, this is a forecast by the um, Energy Information uh, Administration, one of the key agencies that puts these numbers out there. The blue line is energy use by OECD countries, and the red line uh, is uh, by uh, non-OECD countries. And last decade, energy use in the developing world started to exceed the uh, energy use in North America and Western Europe, and it's forecasted to grow exponentially. In fact, 85% of the energy growth in energy use in the next uh, 30 years is going to come from non-OECD countries. Now, the key thing when we're looking at future energy use, and the reason this is looking at the new face of global energy use is the new face of global energy use is really in the developing world. We have large numbers of people who don't have appliances or living in poverty, and as soon as they come out of poverty, what's the first thing they do? They buy a television. What's the next thing they do? They buy a refrigerator. What's the next thing they do? They buy an automobile. And so at small reductions in poverty or moving people just above the poverty line can lead to a big bang in the demand for energy. Whereas income growth amongst us 
has much less impact on uh, energy use or energy demand. And so when we're thinking about looking at the relationship between economic growth and energy demand, it's going to be really important to know whether that growth is pro-poor or pro-rich. If it's pro-rich, it's going to have much smaller effect on energy demand than if it's pro-poor. In fact, the poor have very few appliances now. And we're going to look at some data in a minute in China, where poverty rates have fallen dramatically uh, in the last uh, 20 years, and Brazil and Mexico, where poverty rates have fallen dramatically, in large part because of government policy to bring 20% of their population out of poverty through these conditional cash transfer programs. So this just shows you for three and a half billion people in the world from these countries that only 32% of them have refrigerators right now and only 5% of them uh, have cars. So this is, doesn't represent the whole developing world, just the big countries uh, in the developing world. And if you look at those two countries that I mentioned, Brazil and Mexico, the ones that in the late 90s and early part of this uh, millennium invested heavily in poverty reduction, that's where their asset ownership went up dramatically. 83% and 90, 93% of Brazilians and Mexicans uh, have uh, refrigerators and a third of them uh, have cars. Now, what's going on here? Well, if you look at this picture, uh, what it is is uh, it looks at refrigerator ownership, the share of people in an income group that have ref refrigerator ownership. So if you move along the, ver the horizontal axis, that's uh, income. And you can see in 1996, before the poverty alleviation program, that at the low end, bottom half of the income distribution, uh, refrigerator ownership was quite low. Mexico invested heavily in improving the income of that low end, brought large numbers of people out of poverty, and uh, by 12 years later, in 2008, uh, we saw dramatic increases in uh, refrigerator use. In fact, what's happening is, is because of ignoring the composition of growth in the forecast of energy use, the energy use numbers that I showed you are substantially underestimated. Uh, we, uh, an example would be if we were to look at the forecast they made in 2000 for China's energy use in 2005, it's a 25% underestimate because China had this large reduction in poverty over the time. And so their forecasts, we think, are grossly underestimated. It's much more likely that we'll see uh, energy use in the developing world along that red dotted line than what the uh, current forecasts are. Second, air conditioners. Air conditioners are the new transformers. Why? They're different than other appliances because rising temperatures from climate change increase the demand for air conditioners. We want more condi air conditioners when it becomes hotter, and we use them more when it becomes hotter. And so there's a dynamic feedback effect from climate change on, on their use, and that's going to increase emissions. Uh, here's some work. Uh, with Lucas Davis, who will speak later as, later as well. This is the, the red picture is the variation in temperature in Mexico, and the, um, the blue one is the penetration of air conditioners in Mexico. And what's interesting about this is while we see more air conditioner use in, in more air conditioner purchases in hot areas, in the hottest areas, we don't yet see a lot of, uh, a lot of penetration. For example, look at the Yucatan which is the, um, which is right here. It's really hot, but it's also very poor. As this comes out of poverty, they're gonna buy a whole bunch of air conditioners. Um, and so we see an interaction effect between poverty alleviation and global warming. Um, here are using the universe of household electrical billing records, all 26 million uh, electrical bills from Mexico, we related uh, electricity consumption across temperature, and you start to see increased uh, electricity use as temperatures get hotter. But this is in, uh, just in the average population. If you look at where there's more than 50% sat saturation in air conditioning, that goes up a lot faster. And so when, there's, when people buy more air conditioners, temperature is going to have a bigger effect on energy demand. And energy demand is going to be bigger, air conditioner demand is going to be bigger in areas that have hotter temperatures. So this is the share of households that have air conditioners 
against the income distribution in Mexico for relatively cool areas of Mexico. And you can see air conditioner ownership is really pretty flat. You go into the hotter areas of Mexico and you can see very quickly with income, there's a big increase in air conditioner ownership. And so these two things are gonna feed back. Temperatures rise, we buy more air conditioners. Income rises, we buy more, we, we, see more air, we see more air conditioners bought in hot areas and we see them used more. Um, and in fact, if we were to forecast forward based on standard uh, models of temperature change, we see in Mexico, here's the current distribution of daily mean temperatures and air conditioning is used on this end. Uh, 50 years from now, 30 to 50 years from now, we're going to see a shift from cooler days to a lot of hot days. And so that's a big increase in the demand for air conditioning from, from temperature. And what does that mean overall? Well, based on our simulations, with no increase in air conditioners, with the current 13% of households that have air conditioners, we'll see a 21% increase in uh, energy use, electricity use, and uh, 6.5 million tons of CO2 emissions uh, in, in the air. If you allow temperature to also uh, increase the air conditioners you buy, we see a jump from 13 to 14, 24% ownership of air conditioners, leading to a 26% increase in, um, in uh, uh, electricity use. But the big bang comes when we put economic growth together with temperature increase. And here we see that the rising temperatures combined with higher incomes will likely lead to a 44% air conditioner ownership use, raising energy use by about 34% and putting over uh, 10 million tons of emissions in the air annually above and below what we have now. So what's the messages that come away from this talk. The new face of energy policy is really focusing on the developing world. That's where we're going to see increases. And right now, our forecasts grossly underestimate future energy use, both because they ignore pro-poor growth, they ignore poverty reduction, and they ignore climate change in those forecasts. And this comes not just from more people um, buying uh, buying them and using them, but the costs of manufacturing all these new cars and refrigerators and air conditioners. So what does it mean for policy? In these countries, we're going to see a large need for expanding generation capacity. How do we worry about the efficiency? What types of fuel, fuels we use? That's where the new generating capacity comes on, and that's our opportunity to influence uh, emissions by choosing the right type of efficiency in fuel. Second, we're going to see many new firms and many new households for the first time connect to the bid, to the grid, and buy those first refrigerators. And that may change the cost-benefit ratio of, of how we connect people to the grid. In the U.S., alternative energy is not particularly a, a very cost-effective strategy. It may be, but in, in the U.S., everybody's connected to the grid. As we expand the grid, and we hear from uh, Catherine and Eric Brewer about uh, microgrid technologies, maybe there'll be a better benefit cost ratio. And finally, we're going to have many first time appliance and car owners. And the question is, is what type of efficiency of these uh, services do we bring in? Should we think about the types of solar refrigerators that are being developed at Lawrence Berkeley Labs for $60? Should we think about uh, energy efficiency? Uh, Lucas Davis will have uh, things to say about that. And so uh, thank you. Here are some of the references. Uh, and uh, comments and criticisms, which uh, I'm sure this audience has, uh, are more than welcome. Thanks. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Tom Friedman said in yesterday's New York Times that uh, um, a carbon tax or a, a carbon transfer mechanism would solve all the problems at a uh, World Affairs Conference in San Francisco in March, a professor from University of Maryland said the solution are small, self-contained, efficient, protected uh, nuclear plants. Where do you come out on this? Um, well, I think uh, if you were to ask uh, any economist within uh, 
a 100 mile radius, uh, I think we'd all be in favor of carbon taxes to the extent we're not politically affiliated um, or, or we're not actively involved in politics and trying to get elected. Um, I think most of us, though, are here uh, because we realize the political realities of getting broad, efficient, first best carbon taxes are quite low. Um, and so that's why a lot of the research we see is, um, is in other areas. Uh, and I don't think, I don't think there's, uh, it's, it's a trade-off between carbon taxes and adopting and using more efficient technologies, looking for technological change. Technological change has gotten us out of a lot of problems uh, over the last couple hundred years. So I think they're complementary policies and not, not competing, competing policies. Thank you.